I'm Avery Davidson. Thank you for joining us for the special edition of This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, the only TV show bringing Louisiana farmers and consumers together every week. Right now, we are at the Panama Canal. The 50-mile stretch connects the Caribbean Sea to the Pacific Ocean. We'll share more about that in just a moment. But first, let me tell you why we're in the country of Panama. We're here with LSU Ag Leadership Class 17 as they complete the program with a trip to Panama and Costa Rica. The goal for them is to learn how agriculture worldwide affects what they do on their farms, ranches, and ag-related businesses. Over the 12-day trip, the 23 members of the class met with high-level U.S. officials, industry advocates, and farmers and ranchers who work hard to provide us all with a safe, affordable, and abundant food supply. And what better place to see food globalization than here at the Agua Clara expansion to the Panama Canal. In fact, there's a ship right there loaded down with cargo that will be going through this canal. And this is the expanded part that allows more ships, bigger ships to go through. Twyla's Neil Malasson tells us why this canal is important to you and Louisiana agriculture. Wow. Would they say that's one of the seven wonders of the modern world? You just witnessed it. Yep. This is what Jacob Nugier and Romeo Stalling are watching. The redhead here is beginning its transit from the Pacific to the Atlantic at the Miraflores locks of the Panama Canal. It's only a 50 mile journey from one ocean to the other, but decades in the making with a lot of hard effort in between. It's also perhaps the second most important waterway to Louisiana besides the Mississippi, as a lot of the grains and other products that come down that river pass through here. It was it was moving for a moment, you know, not to not to over explain it, but that was uh, that was special to see and, and say I've been at the on the banks of the Panama Canal watching the ships cross and uh, so that was certainly special to see and and Romeo made the comment. He said, man, I can't believe we're seeing this and it was, that, that was a bucket list item. You know, I mean, who who can say that they've they've got to witness that. So that's that's pretty special. It is an engineering marvel that uses a number of resources to keep it going. The locks are powered by an electric grid and the force of water keeps the locks sealed. Special train engine cars here keep the ship steady as she goes while the ship itself provides propulsion. It's a sight that draws attention every day. Some of the crowd here today are Panamanian. After the U.S. turned over the canal to Panama in 2000, it especially became cemented into their national culture and pride. Certainly the canal is a very important part of Panama's identity as well as uh, driving a, a sector of their economy. Uh, you don't have just uh, boats crossing back and forth, but Panama's also developed a very strong uh, third-party logistics industry where you're shipping down uh, you know, full containers of products that can then get offloaded uh, at, at the ports here. As large as the SS Redhead is, it isn't the biggest to transit the canal. For that, you have to travel to the other side of the isthmus to the Agua Clara locks on the Caribbean Sea. This is a post-Panamax ship, and the expansion in 2016 of the canal was specifically designed to accommodate these huge ocean-going vessels that have more than twice the capacity the other ship you saw has. You can see below that one of the two lock gates can't be closed when the ship plus its tugs are going through. Franklin Parish grain farmer Cody Beavers is in all of the locks and the canal system, but feels some pride too, knowing his grains could be on a ship like this headed out to feed the world. The Panama Canal in itself is just a, a excellent benefit for the whole modern world. Um, just the efficiency of travel for all these uh, freight uh, liners, um, and that some of my grain might come through. I mean, that's from my little farm in Franklin Parish. I mean, that's kind of incredible that it may come through the Panama Canal. Now this giant post Panamax ship you see behind me are exactly what these new locks at Agua Clara were built for. They're extra wide to accommodate the extra cargo these ships can contain. These ships, they're charged about a million dollars to transit the 50 miles of the Panama Canal. And even still, it's worth it to companies to send them through as the transit around South America is more than twice as long. Reporting from the Panama Canal, I'm Neil Malanson. If you're watching this when most stations air us in Louisiana, you're probably enjoying your morning cup of coffee right about now. Well, some of that coffee could come from here. This is the Doka Coffee Farm on the slopes of the Poas Volcano, which you see right there behind me. Now here, beans are grown, harvested, and roasted to perfection. These white flowers create boosts of energy. As LSU Ag Leadership Class 17 is learning at Doka Estate Coffee Farm, each flower will produce one coffee fruit. We have to leave them on the plants until they turn 
Right. Tour guide Andrea Rojas explains that most coffee fruit will produce two coffee beans, but sometimes the fruit will produce only one bean, which is called a pea berry. So what happens is that this single one took, absorbed, stole all the sugar from another one that didn't grow. So this single bean has the sugar of two beans and it's very sweet. Oh, wow. Wow is right because doka will separate the pea berries from the other coffee beans to make a coffee that is naturally sweeter. Rojas explains that Costa Rica focuses on quality coffee because growers here cannot produce as much as Brazil, Colombia, and Vietnam. Still, doka will increase the number of beans by planting two coffee trees in the same hole. Costa Rica is a very small country and we are not able to produce quantity. So this is a technique to save a space in the ground and produce more in a smaller place. And everyone's picked by hand. Can you imagine? Class member and Louisiana 4-H Regional Coordinator Esther Bow is a self-described coffee fanatic. My husband and I, we have certain cups that we drink out of, we have certain coffee creamers that we use, and we buy certain coffee varieties, and so we're pretty picky about our coffee. It's on the tour where Bo and the class learn that Doka is picky about which beans get picked. They said I can go home once I fill up the bucket, but uh, I got a long way to go. And as class member Romeo Stalling learned, Doka is also picky about who does the picking. The majority of the workers who hand pick the coffee fruit come from Nicaragua. Most of the Costa Rican people are looking for something more stable. And also because, well, to be honest, Costa Rica have a better economy than the, those countries, or the, the countries in this, in this region. So, well, uh, Costa Rican people prefer to do another kind of Labor. They want skilled labor, they want happy labor, and so when she was talking about the labor, she said that they provide, you know, child care for the family. They want the family to come together. And family is important at Doka, as this is a third generation coffee farm still operated by the Vargas family, who oversee every step of the process from planting to sun drying of the beans down to the roasting and grinding to ensure you get a quality cup of coffee. This commodity that we consume every day in our homes has a almost a magical feeling. Sugarcane production is big business in Costa Rica with farmers here growing more than 4 million metric tons of sugarcane in 2022. That's according to the USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service. In that same year, Costa Rica exported more than 78 million metric tons of sugar to the U.S. Meanwhile, its neighbor, Panama, sent more than $21 million worth of sugar into the United States. Welcome to Ingenio Cutris, a sugar mill in the Alajuela province of Costa Rica surrounded by nearly 150 acres of sugarcane. On the inaugural tractor tour of the fields and facilities surrounding the mill, members of LSU Ag Leadership Class 17 get to see the wastewater management practices of the mill where water from the mill is moved from one pond to another to remove sediment and allow useful bacteria to clean the water clean enough for it to be safe haven for wildlife like this caiman. Later on on the tour, the class learns how the mill deals with byproducts of producing sugar, bagasse, ash from burned bagasse, and filter cake. At Coutrice, those three byproducts are made into compost and aggressively mixed by a tractor. Coutrice then uses that compost as the base when planting sugarcane. This is where members of the class involved in sugarcane production got to be hands-on with their Costa Rican experience. St. Landry Parish sugarcane farmer Dallas Ardouin poured the compost base. Classmate Romeo Stalling learns a new way of planting sugarcane where single billets are placed across the row spaced about a foot and a half apart. Class members Randy Richard, a sugarcane researcher and crop consultant, and Matt Gravois, a sugarcane farmer from St. James Parish, demonstrate how they plant cane in Louisiana with billets or whole stalks in the bottom of the row overlapping each other. So the way that they're planting like that is completely different as, as you know that we do it at home. I think it's something that they're doing it on a trial basis to try to see how it's going to work and they like the, the results so far, but I think they're just, you know, they're just starting in their trial and testing on stuff like that. You definitely have a better seed ratio if you can hand plant it that way, but the problem is you would have to have a very immaculate billet and not have any damage to that billet in order for that to work out. It's not just the planting method that seems different to Richard, but the sugarcane fields themselves, most of which are hand harvested by migrant workers from neighboring Nicaragua. Very small plots of sugarcane. It wasn't on a widespread acreage. It was very unique to see sugarcane growing on slopes of mountains. You can see why mechanization 
of, of harvesting a crop like that would be a challenge with the, the sheer slope of the land. Also, I saw lots of giant boulders in the soil that would impede the harvest. Inside the mill, members of the class see firsthand the process of extracting the juice from sugarcane and then boiling it down to get the raw sugar crystals and molasses. Cutrice is one of five mills in the country, and half of the cane that goes through here is grown by the mill. The other half is from nearby farmers. That said, it is a small mill when compared to those in Louisiana. In our terms, a small mill, but I think in their terms, it's a, it's a, it's a normal sized mill. But yeah, they're grinding about 2,200 uh, tons a day, which is small for us. It would take this mill here a week to grind what our mill grinds in one day. Costa Rica is a smaller but certainly efficient producer of sugar. Evan Mangino is the agricultural counselor for the USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service to Costa Rica and Nicaragua. He says Costa Rica's sugar industry could be more profitable than it is. The sugar industry in Costa Rica, I think, has more potential than what it's allowed to really achieve. Uh, and that's predominantly because, like you mentioned, the co-generation aspect of you know, sugar revenue is very limited for them because in Costa Rica, it is actually not permitted to sell electricity onto the grid and the national electricity utility does not want to buy it. So the sugar millers here really are missing out on a huge chunk of their potential revenue. And Henio Cutrice does produce electricity by burning bagasse and sells power to a neighboring city, but not to the national grid. It's something Ardwan finds interesting, but he has a deeper connection to this mill. Some of the guys that work for this mill, they come on a contract through our mill, Asuka, in St. Martinville. You know, they harvest cane here, that's what they do here, and then they come and they run our harvest crew at home. So it's really cool to see uh, guys that are coming on our farm and that I've gotten to know pretty well to see where they live and where they work and how they operate differently over here than we do at home. There are about 1.5 million head of cattle in Panama and close to that number in Costa Rica as well. For members of LSU Ag Leadership Class 17 who work with cattle, this tour of a ranch outside of Santiago where they raise primarily Brahmin cattle was a highlight of the trip. With lush mountains in the background, Brahmin cattle graze in the pasture. This is the Calabacito Ranch west of Santiago, Panama. It's one of four ranches where the Spiegel family has been raising Brahmin cattle for more than 60 years. Rodrigo Spiegel, who graduated with a degree from Texas A&M, operates the ranch and focuses primarily on genetics. He's proud to show off his 2022 Blue Bonnet Kickoff Grand Champion Brahmin Bull, Mr. H. Malone Manso 326-9. While Spiegel's cattle are winning awards in the United States, he's now using Brazilian genetics in his herd. They have two things that are important, and it's the number of heads of cattle they have to make selection, and also all the data they keep on their cattle. The Brazilians could tell us how many hairs a cow has. They, they, they're they're uh, too much for uh, data. And so I have started bringing some semen from Brazil to cross with my American bred uh, cows. And we're beginning to see now the, the results in a year, year and a half, we will see if that really worked. But I think it works because it's, even the Brazilian cattle has uh, a lot of the Brahman. Rapids Parish cattleman Robert Duncan is a member of LSU Ag Leadership Class 17. He says hearing that Spiegel is using Brazilian genetics illustrates the global competition in the cattle industry. When he gets a lot of his genetics from South America, it makes you, makes you wonder what we can do better to, as an industry to, to bring that business back to America. While Duncan's herd does not look like this, cattle with light hides, long ears, and humps on their backs, seeing Spiegel's ranch has him thinking. We already do have some Brahmin cattle, uh, not as near, nearly as many as we'd like, or as I'd like, but we're, we're getting that direction. We already use the Brangus influence. Um, so we have that, that boss indicus trait to them to, to fight the heat and fight the, the insects. But um, it's, it's something to look out there and see all those, all those gray Brahma mama cows. And uh, it's, they make them look good over here. After a walk to the nearby Rio Aclita, Duncan sees something else that looks good, Spiegel's pastures. Coming down the road, coming in, we, we saw a lot of I'm not even gonna call it pasture, more like prairie land. Uh, you know, very similar to West Texas, not much of anything scrub brush. And then you get, you know, here to his place and it's just, it's beautiful. We're a little closer to the river, um, but all the grass that's here, he brought in from, from South America and planted 
and it's, it's just different grass selection than, than what's native, and so it holds up a lot better. It also holds up because Spiegel makes his own fertilizer using the waste from his coal cow slaughter facility. Now we're processing them and making uh, fertilizer, and we're making it so that we treat it so there will be no weeds on it, and that helps a lot on uh, could help us a lot on ranches because of the cost of fertilizer. Today, the cost of fertilizer is way up high. So if you could use a, a, a cheap, good fertilizer, organic, uh, you couldn't find it any better. What also does not get any better for Spiegel is hosting groups like Class 17. Sharing uh, information with people in the same industry is, uh, is very good because we, we, we talk the same language. Still to come on this special edition of This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, we'll tour a farmer's market in Central America with someone who manages farmer's markets in downtown Baton Rouge. But first, Panama and Costa Rica are rich in history and culture. We'll share the experience. Stay with us. Panama and Costa Rica each have a rich cultural history. The area has been inhabited by the indigenous people of America since prehistory. More recently, the oldest city in Latin America was founded in what is now Panama City. This week, Twyla's Neil Malonso takes a look at the ingredients that make this neck of America so vibrant. Panama and Costa Rica are both well known as international destinations for both tourists and commerce alike. The LSU Ag Leadership Class 17 started in Panama, which of course has been renowned worldwide for the Panama Canal for more than a century. But the land itself has been inhabited since prehistory by such tribes as the Nagobe, Embera, and Guna tribes. They had advanced pottery making and metalwork alike. Spanish colonizers also left their mark. This is Panama Viejo, the old city which was used as a base to find gold for the Spanish crown. It was destroyed by the famous Captain Morgan and rebuilt a few miles away. This mostly intact church tower provides a great vista of the city where old and new reside together. Since the Panama Canal was returned to Panama in 2000, it has become a truly international city with investments from all over the U.S. and South America as well as further abroad. Costa Rica, meanwhile, has figured out a way to bring international visitors all on its own. It has branded itself as an ecological haven with many national parks and preserves. The result is greenery and wildlife everywhere. On a single river tour, the class saw monkeys, crocodiles, birds of every feather, and lizards everywhere. Many of these preserved areas were next to and often overlapped the farms of the country. Many of the farms were big agritourism stops, such as the Doka Coffee Farm on the side of Mount Poas, one of four volcanoes around the capital city of San Jose. Busloads of tourists pour money into not just farm products, but ecological conservation. In both countries, we found the people to be very warm and friendly. English was spoken widely, and if you tried a little Spanish, they really opened up. Many thanks to our guides in both countries, whose extensive expertise made the trip a smooth experience. For This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, I'm Neil Malonson. There are more than 44 farmers markets across Louisiana, but none are quite like this. Welcome to the farmers market in San Jose, Costa Rica, where you'll find fruits, vegetables, spices, coffee, everything that you could hope to find and enjoy this culture. But you'll also find someone who runs farmers markets in Louisiana eager to learn all about this place. It is awesome. Darlene Adams Rowland is a member of LSU Ag Leadership Class 17 and also very interested in farmers markets. As the executive director of the Big River Economic and Agricultural Development Alliance, which runs the Red Stick Farmers Market in Baton Rouge, she feels right at home in the Zapote district of San Jose, Costa Rica. Every time I travel, the first thing I do is try to find the local farmers market because you really just get a sense of the pulse of the community, you know, what their traditions are, what they eat. It's where people congregate naturally. And so, you know, to be here on a Sunday morning and just see the amount of produce and that obviously that the community supports is just amazing to see the tie to the agriculture and the people. With flags flapping in the wind and bright produce on display, 
Roland finds some ideas she can share back in Louisiana. Definitely the way that they use their tables, the height, the way they display the produce, it makes it really visually attractive for the consumer. So I think there's a lot to learn just in each person's presentation of their goods and just the pride that they have and, and the way they really interact with the public as they walk by and being more forward instead of sort of just sitting back. And, you know, I, I noticed that at our market, too. We have some vendors who are a lot more um, engaging and, you know, it works. Still to come on Twyla, we get deep into the woods with this next story. Stay with us. Teakwood is valued because it's strong, durable, and naturally water resistant. And teak grows here in Panama, much to the delight of one forester who is a member of LSU Ag Leadership Class 17. Among the rare plants and trees in Panama, these may be some of the rarest. This is teakwood, and this Panama plantation represents a tiny but growing business here. Jeff Duda is president of Panama Teak Forestry and says they have found a niche in the market that allows this mostly Asian product to thrive half a world away. There's a lot of middlemen from the tree to the person buying a teak chair. And we're looking at step by step reducing that. Duda says land management is key to teak success in Panama. Like any other forestry, it's a crop that can take 25 years to reach its full value. We also have our own mill that we're developing so we can make products and we have our own retail website so we can sell wholesale retail and we can go, it's like going from, you know, farm to table. We're going from farm to actually being the table. <laughs> One of the ways land is managed is by culling trees after they get to a certain size. To measure that, this prism is used to count the trees in a certain area. Forester Ben Garasco is familiar with the tool, using it in the Florida parishes of Louisiana for his job. He says while teak is unlikely to be viable back home, there is a lot to learn here. This, this is a real specialty market. Seeing some of the boards, you know, it's a hardwood. It's got you know different grain, different uh, strength properties than pine, so uh, it, it's just a, a whole different ball game. Garasco says one comparable issue is labor between the U.S. and Panama. Both countries have some issues sourcing labor, but whereas machines handle a lot of work in Louisiana, here it's done all by hand. They do chainsaw thinnings. Um, I, I haven't heard yet as far as how they transport trees and you know to the mill and things of that nature, but um, everything is mechanized at home and there's a lot more hand uh, labor in this area. One thing bringing both countries together is finding a way to keep providing all the forest products under the sun while dealing with challenging conditions. Reporting from Sona Valley, Panama, I'm Neil Melanson. That does it for this special edition of This Week in Louisiana Agriculture from Panama and Costa Rica. And that's a good thing because it's starting to rain here over at Fica Don Juan in the northern zone of Costa Rica. It's an absolutely beautiful organic farm and a great tourist destination as well. So if ever you're in this part of Costa Rica, be sure to come and check it out. But before we go, I'd like to thank a few people who made this show possible. First and foremost, Dr. Bobby Swallow, the director of the LSU Ag Leadership Program, for making this possible and for allowing us to come along and show the journey that Class 17 has gone down, especially considering a two-year program got stretched out to three years with all that adversity. I'd also like to thank Cheryl Duplachan with the LSU Ag Center for putting all this together and making sure that we had a schedule that would run absolutely on time. I'd also like to thank our guides who helped us traverse not only language barriers, but actual physical barriers, Luis and Sergio. We couldn't have done this without you all. Now, obviously, this show had a lot in it, and we actually shot more than we can fit into this one show. So be sure to watch in the coming weeks as we share more stories from this trip to Panama and Costa Rica. That does it for this edition of This Week in Louisiana Agriculture. We hope to see you again right here next week, and Pura Vida.